Hi, this is Paranormal Girl. By now, we will all have known the story of Travis Walton's abduction back in 1975. It was a very famous UFO abduction. And if you haven't, I will now tell you the story. Travis Walton, born February 10th, 1953 is an American logger who was supposedly abducted by a UFO on November the 5th, 1975, while working with a logging crew in the Apache Stitch Greaves National Forest in Arizona. Walton could not be found, but reappeared after a five-day search. The Walton case received mainstream publicity and remains one of the best-known instances of alleged alien abduction. UFO historian Jerome Clark writes that few abduction reports have generated as much controversy as the Walton case. It is furthermore one of the very few alien abduction cases with corroborative eyewitnesses, one of few abduction, sorry, abduction cases with the time allegedly spent in the custody of aliens play rather a minor role in the overall account. UFO researchers Jenny Randalls and Peter Haug write, neither before or since has an abduction story begun in a manner related by Walton and his co-workers. Furthermore, the Walton case is singular in that the victim vanished for days on end with police squads out searching. It is a typical close encounter of the fourth kind, which bucks the trend so much that it worried some investigators. Others defend it staunchly. Discovery in the Woods The case began on Wednesday, November the 5th, 1975. Then, 22-year-old Walton was employed by Mike Rogers, who had for nine years contracted with the United States Forest Service for various duties. Rogers and Walton were best friends. Walton dated Roger's sister Dana, whom he later married. Others on the crew were Ken Peterson, John Gillette, Steve Pierce, Alan Dallas and Dwayne Smith. They all lived in the town of Snowflake, Arizona. Rogers was hired to thin out scrub brush and the undergrowth from a large area more than 1,200 acres near Turkey Springs, Arizona. The job was the most lucrative contract Rogers had received from the Forest Service, but the job was behind schedule. As a result, they worked overtime to fulfill the contract, typically from 6am till sunset. Just after 6 p.m. on November the 5th, Rogers and his crew finished their work for the day and piled into Rogers' truck for the drive back to Snowflake. The crew reported that shortly after beginning the drive home, they saw a bright light from behind a hill. They drove closer and said that they saw a large silvery disc hovering above a clearing and shining brightly. It was around 8 feet high and 20 feet in diameter. Rogers stopped the truck and Walton leapt out and ran towards the disc. The others said they shouted at Walton to come back, but he continued toward the disc. The men in the truck reported that Walton was nearly below the object when the disc began making noises similar to a loud turbine. The disc then began to wobble from side to side and Walton began to cautiously walk away from the object. Jerome Clark wrote that just after Walton moved away from the disc, the others insisted they saw a beam of blue-green light coming from the disc and strike Walton. Clark went on to write that Walton rose a foot into the air, his arms and legs outstretched, and shot back stiffly some ten feet, all the while caught in the glow of the light. His right shoulder hit the earth and his body sprawled limply over the ground. The search. At about 7.30pm, Peterson called police from 
Harbour, Arizona, near Snowflake. Deputy Sheriff Chuck Ellison answered the telephone. Peterson initially reported that only one of the logging crew was missing. Ellison then met the crew at a shopping centre. They related the tale to him. All the men distraught, two of them in tears. And though he was somewhat sceptical of the fantastic account, Ellison would rather later reflect that if, if they were acting, they were awfully good at it. Ellison notified his superior, Sheriff Marlin Gillespie. He told Ellison to keep the crew in harbour until he could arrive with Officer Ken Copland to interview the men. In less than an hour, Gillespie and Copland arrived. They heard the tale from the crew. Rogers insisted on returning to the scene immediately to search for Walton, with tracking dogs if possible. No dogs were available, but the police and some of the crew returned to the scene. Crew members Smith, Pearson and Gillette were too upset to be much help in the search, so they elected to return to Snowflake and relate the bad news to friends and family. At the scene, the law enforcement officers became suspicious of the story related by the crew, mainly because there was nothing in the way of physical evidence to back up the account. Though more police and volunteers arrived to search the area, they found not a trace of Walton. Winter nights could be bitterly cold in the mountains, and Walton had only worn jeans, a denim jacket, and a shirt. The police were worried that Walton could fall victim to hypothermia if he were lost. Rogers and Sheriff Copland went to tell the news to Walton's mother, Mary Walton Kellett, who lived on a small ranch at Bear Creek, some 10 miles from Snowflake. Rogers told her what had happened and she asked him to repeat the account. She then asked calmly if anyone other than the police and the eyewitnesses, had heard the story. Copland thought her reserved responses were odd. This factor contributed to the growing suspicion among police that something other than a UFO was responsible for Walton's abs absence. On the other hand, Clark noted that Kellett was known as being generally guarded and had furthermore raised six children, largely by herself, and often trying circumstances, which had long since taught her not to fly to pieces in the face of crisis and tragedies. Yet in the days ahead, as events overwhelmed her, she would show emotion before friends, acquaintances and strangers alike, a fact that would go unmentioned in debunking treatments of the Walton episode. About 3 a.m., Kellett telephoned Dwayne Walton, her second oldest son. He left his home in Glendale, Arizona, and drove to Snowflake. By morning of November the 6th, officials and volunteers had scoured the area around the scene where Walton went missing. No trace of him was discovered. The police suspicions were growing that the UFO tale was concocted to cover up an accident or homicide. Saturday morning, Rogers and Dwayne Walton arrived at Sheriff Gillespie's office, explosively angry, because they had returned to the scene and found no police there. By that afternoon, police were searching for Walton with helicopters, horse-mounted officers and jeeps. Publicity by Saturday. Word of Walton's disappearance had spread internationally. News reporters ufologists and curious began traveling to Snowflake. Among the visitors was Fred Sylvanus, a Phoenix UFO investigator, who interviewed Rogers and Dwayne Walton on Saturday, November the 8th. While repeatedly expressing worry for Walton's well-being and criticizing what they saw as a half-hearted search effort by police, both men would make statements that would return to haunt them when seized upon by critics. 
On the recordings made by Sylvanus, Rogers noted that because of Walton's disappearance and the subsequent search, he would be unable to complete his contract with the Forest Service, and he hoped the search for his missing friend would mitigate the situation. Dwayne Walton reported he and Walton quite interested in UFOs and that some 12 years earlier Dwayne had witnessed a UFO similar to the one witnessed by the logging crew. Dwayne reported that he and Walton had both decided that if they'd had the chance they would get as close as possible to any UFO they might see. Dwayne also suggested that Walton would not be injured by the aliens because they don't harm people without intending to do so. Rogers and Dwayne Walton had laid the foundations for the alternative interpretation of the case with their statements. Walton would later report that he never had a keen interest in UFOs, even after his supposed abduction. But the tape recorded statement of his brother Dwayne, while Walton was still missing, runs contrary to Walton's statements. Shortly after the Sylvanus interview, Snowflake Town Marshal Sanford Flake announced that the entire affair was a prank engineered by Dwayne and Travis. They had fooled logging crew by lighting a balloon and releasing it at the appropriate time. Flake's wife disagreed suggesting that her husband's story was just as far-fetched as Dwayne Walton's. In the meantime, police officers were making repeated visits to Kellett's home. Dwayne once returned there to find her in tears as she was being questioned in her living room. Dwayne told the police to leave unless they had something new to relate or to ask. Dwayne suggested that she speak with police only on the front porch, which would allow her to end the interview any time she chose to simply by going inside. She did exactly that after Marshall Flake arrived to relate a message, which Clark notes contributed to the feeling among skeptics that Kellett was hiding something or someone. Duane also spoke with William H. Spaulding of Ground Saucer Watch. Spaulding suggested that if Walton ever returned, the GSW would provide a doctor to examine him in confidence. Spaulding also suggested that if Walton returned, he should save his first urination after returning so it could be tested. Polygraph on Monday, November the 10th. All of Roger's remaining crew took polygraph examinations administered by C. Gilson, an Arizona Department of Public Safety employee. His questions asked if any of the men caused harm to Walton or knew who had caused Walton harm, if they knew where Walton's body was buried and if they told the truth about seeing a UFO. All the men denied harming Walton or knowing who had harmed him. They also denied knowing where his body was and insisted they had indeed seen a UFO. Except in Dallas, who had not completed his exam, thus rendering it invalid, Gilson concluded that all the men were truthful and the exam results were conclusive. Clark quotes from Gilson's official report. These polygraph examinations prove that these five men did see some object they believed to be a UFO and that Travis Walton was not injured or murdered by any of these men on that Wednesday. If the UFO was fake, Gilson thought, five of these men had no prior knowledge of it. Following the polygraph tests, Sheriff Gillespie announced that he accepted the UFO story, saying, there's no doubt they're telling the truth. In 2009, Walter had a participant on game show Moment of Truth. When asked if he was abducted by a UFO in 1975, he responded, yes an answer which the polygraph examiner determined to be a deceptive prior to tapping. 
Walton, in response to this outcome, said the polygraphs were 97% accurate, even in the best of cases. The medical exam. Duane remembered Spalding's promise of a confidential medical examination. Without having notified authorities of Walton's return, Duane drove him to Phoenix, Arizona, late on Tuesday morning, where they were to meet Dr. Lester Stewart. The Waltons reported that they were disappointed to learn that Stewart was not a medical doctor, as Spalding had promised, but a hypnotherapist. Spalding and Stewart would later report that the Waltons had stayed with them for over two hours, while the Waltons insist they were at Stewart's office for at most 45 minutes, most of which was occupied by trying to determine the nature of Stewart's qualifications. The precise time spent with Stewart would later become an issue in the case. Walton's return makes the news. By Tuesday afternoon, word of Walton's return had leaked out to the public. Duane took a telephone call from Spalding and told Spalding not to bother the family again. Clark writes that after his telephone call, Spalding became a sworn enemy in the case. Among the other telephone calls after news of Walton's return was one from Coral Lorenzen of APRO, a civilian UFO research group. She promised Duane that she could arrange an examination for Walton by two medical doctors, a general practitioner Joseph Saltz and paediatrician Howard Candle at Duane's home. Duane agreed and the exam began at about 3.30pm on Tuesday. Clark writes that between Lorenzen's call and the physician's examination, another party would enter and hugely complicate the story. Lorenzen was telephoned by an employee of the National Enquirer, an American tabloid newspaper known for its sensualistic <laughs> tone. The Enquirer employee promised to finance the APRO's investigation in exchange for APRO's cooperation and, accept, and access to the Waltons, since the Enquirer's financial resources were far greater than the APRO's. Lorenzen agreed to the arrangement. The medical examination revealed that Walton was essentially in good health, but they did note two unusual features. A small red spot at the crease of Walton's right elbow that was consistent to a hypodermic injection. But the doctors also noted that the spot was not near a vein. Analysis of Walton's urine revealed a lack of ketones. This was unusual given that if Walton had indeed been gone five days with little or no food as he insisted, and as his weight loss suggested, his body would have begun breaking down fats in order to survive, and this should have led to a very high levels of ketone in his urine. Critics would argue this inconsistency is evidence against Walton's story. Walton would later speculate that he had gotten the mark on his elbow in the course of his logging work. Critics would speculate that the mark showed where Walton, or someone else, had injected drugs into his system. Walt Clark dismisses this possibility of drugging as most unlikely, given that the medical doctors found no sign of it. But he also notes that perhaps more difficult to explain is the absence of bruises which one might expect in the wake of Walton's alleged beam-driven collision with the ground. Walton in the UFO Walton in the UFO hangar Walton reported that after approaching the UFO near the work site, the last thing he remembered was being struck by a beam of light. When he woke, Walton said he was on a reclined bed. A bright light shone above him, and the air was heavy and wet. 
He was in pain and had some trouble breathing, but his first thought was that he was in a normal hospital. As his faculties returned, Walton says he realised he was surrounded by three figures, each wearing a sort of orange jumpsuit. The figures were not human. Walton described the beings as typical of, as the so-called greys, which feature in some abduction accounts. Shorter than five feet, they had bald heads and no hair. Their heads were domed very large. They looked like fetuses. They had large eyes, enormous eyes, almost all brown, without much white in them. The creepiest thing about them were those eyes. They just stared through me. Their ears, noses and mouths seemed real small, maybe just because their eyes were so huge. Walter related that he feared for his safety and got to his feet. He shouted at the creatures to stay away. He grabbed a glass-like cylinder from a nearby shelf and tried to break its tip to create a makeshift knife, but found the object unbreakable. So instead, he waved it at the creatures as a weapon. The trio of creatures left him in the room. Matheson finds this portion of the narrative troublingly inconsistent, noting that despite his weakened condition, aching body and splitting pain in his skull, ladies for which no cause is suggested, he had no trouble jumping up from his operating table, seizing a conveniently placed glass like rod and assuming a karate fighting stance, frightened them with this display of macho aggression, enough at least to cause them to run away. Walton then left the exam room via a hallway which led to a spherical room with only a high back chair placed in the centre of the room. Though he was afraid where he might be someone, sorry, though he was afraid there might be someone seated in the chair, Walton says he walked towards it and as he did, lights began to appear in the room. The chair was empty, so Walton says he sat in it. When he did, the room was filled with lights, similar to stars projected on a round planetarium ceiling. The chair was equipped on the left arm with a single short thick lever with an oddly shaped moulded handle atop some dark brown material. On the right arm, there was an illuminated light green screen, about five inches square with black lines intersected at all angles. When Walton pushed the lever, he reported that the stars rotated around him slowly. When he released the lever, the stars remained in the new, at their new position. He decided to stop manipulating the lever since he had no idea what it might do. He left the chair and the stars disappeared. Walton thought he had seen a rectangular outline on the rounded wall, perhaps a door and he went to look for it. Just then, Walton heard a sound behind him. He turned, expecting some more of the short, large-eyed great, large-eyed creatures, but was pleasantly surprised to see a tall human figure wearing blue coveralls and a glassy helmet. At the time, Walton said he didn't realise how odd the man's eyes were, larger than normal, and a bright gold colour. Walton says that he asked the man a number of questions, but the man only grinned and motioned for Walton to follow him. Walton also said that because of the man's helmet, he might have been unable to hear him. So he followed the man down the hallway, which led to a door and a steep ramp down to a large room. Walton described as similar to an aircraft hangar. Walton says he realised he had just left the disc-shaped craft, similar to the one he had seen in the forest, just before he had been struck by the bluish light, but the craft perhaps was twice as large. In the hangar-like room, Walton reported seeing other disc-shaped craft. The man led into another room containing three more humans, a woman and two men. <laughs> 
resembling the helmeted man. These people did not wear helmets, so Walton says he began asking questions of them. They responded with the same dull grin and led him by his arm to a small table. Once he was seated on the table, Walton says he realised that the woman held a device like an oxygen mask, which he placed on his face. Before he could fight back, Walton said he passed out. When he awoke again, Walton says he was outside the gas station of Herbert, Arizona. One of the disc-shaped craft was hovering just above the highway. After a moment, the craft shot away, and Walton stumbled to the telephones and called his brother-in-law, Grant Neff. He thought that only a few hours had passed. After hearing Walton's story, Gillespie speculated that Walton may have been hit on the head and drugged then taken to a normal hospital where he had confused the details of a routine exam with something more spectacular. Walton dismissed this, noting that the medical examination had found no trace of head trauma or drugs in his system. Walton told Sheriff Gillespie that he was willing to take a polygraph, a truth serum or undergo hypnosis to support his account. Gillespie said that a polygraph would suffice and he promised to arrange one in secret to avoid the growing media circus. Dwayne and Travis then drove to Scottsdale, Arizona, where a meeting with the APRO consultant James A. Harder had been arranged. Harder hypnotised Walton, hoping to uncover more details of the missing five days. Clark writes that unlike many other abductees, however, Walton's conscious recall and unconscious memory were the same. And he would account for only a maximum of two hours, and perhaps less, of his missing five days. Curiously, Walton encountered an impenetrable mental block and expressed the view that he would die if the regression continued. Suppressed polygraph exam and controversy. In the meantime, Spalding had announced to the press that he and Dr. Stewart had questioned Walton for two hours and had uncovered inconsistencies in Walton's account that would blow this story out. The Phoenix Gazette ran a story about Stewart, who related his claims to the Walton's fear exposure of a carefully crafted lie. Sheriff Gillespie arranged for a polygraph, and when word of the exam was leaked to the press, Dwayne cancelled it, thinking that Gillespie had broken his promise to keep the test a secret. Gillespie would later insist he had not leaked a word of the polygraph, and that the case had become too centralistic to keep anything secret for long. The National Enquirer wanted Walton to take a polygraph as soon as possible and arranged for one. After Duane insisted that he and Walton have the power to veto any public disclosure of the test results, Harder thought that Walton was too distraught to take a polygraph. But the examiner, John J. McCarthy, of the Arizona Polygraph Laboratory, said he could take Walton's nervous state into consideration. In interviewing Walton before the exam began, McCarthy extracted two admissions from him. First, he had smoked marijuana a few times, but he had never used the drug regularly. And secondly, he and Mike Rogers' younger brother had committed check fraud a few years earlier by altering payroll checks. It was his only serious brush with the law. Walton completed two years probation without further incident. But Walter, sorry, but Walton remained deeply embarrassed about the check fraud episode. Incidentally, Philip J. Class notes that Walton once claimed to have been jailed for this crime, though he actually received two years probation as a first time offender. McCarthy then administered the polygraph, which remained mired in controversy. Walton asserts McCarthy behaved unprofessionally, while McCarthy insists Walton's both failed the polygraph and tried to cheat. 
At one point, says Walton, McCarthy asked if Walton had concluded, oh, sorry, had colluded with anyone to perpetrate a hoax. Walton said he was unfamiliar with the word, and Walton reported that McCarthy replied, in the confrontational and aggressive manner that collusion was planning or conspiring with another, just as Walton had colluded to steal and forge payroll checks. After completing the exam, McCarthy determined that Walton was lying. Clark quotes McCarthy's official report based on his reaction on all charts. It's the, it's the opinion of this examiner that Walton, in concert with others, is attempting to perpetrate a UFO hoax and that he was not, sorry, he has not been on any spacecraft. Later, McCarthy would assert that sometimes Travis would hold his breath in an effort to beat the machine. The Waltons, APRO and the National Enquirer then agreed to keep the results of the polygraph a secret. Due it in large part, they insisted to doubt about McCarthy's methods and objectivity. Eight months later, when the word of this decision was made public, there would be more charges of deception and cover-up. Walter would later take and pass two additional polygraph exams, though the suppressed results of the first exam would shadow him and earn mention in nearly every discussion of the case to the present. One word of the suppressed polygraph was made public by class. Many who had thought Walton had related a true account or at least what he thought was a true account, reconsidered the case with a more sceptical eye. Walton, Duane and the APRO members argued that McCarthy was biased and had asked Walton embarrassing, irrelative, ir sorry, irrelevant questions in an effort to create turbulent conditions more likely to produce a negative result. According to Clark, the opinions of recognised polygraph experts were divided about the propriety of McCarthy's exam. Harry Reid supported the validity of McCarthy's exam, while psychologist Dave, David Raskin of the University of Utah asserted that McCarthy's method was more than 30 years out of date. Philip J. Class an aviation journalist by profession, but also a well-known UFO debunker, launched a concerted, sustained critique against Walton's claims, arguing especially that there was a strong financial motive to the entire affair. Rogers knew he would be unable to complete his contract with the Forest Service, argued Class, and he concocted a scheme to invoke the contract's Act of God clause thus dissolving the contract without fault. Others argued against this idea, noting that defaulting on a forest service contract was not necessarily the catastrophe class implied. Rogers had failed to complete two of his many earlier forest service contracts, yet had been rehired without apparent prejudice. Furthermore, despite his anxiety over the contract, Rogers never invoked or tried to invoke the Act of God clause in the aftermath of Walton's disappearance. Class and others also noted that the UFO incident was broadcast on NBC just a few weeks before Walton's disappearance. This made for television film and was fictionalised account of the Hill abduction. The first widely publicised case of alien abduction. Class and others speculated that Walton had been a spy by the programme. Walton denied that he had watched the programme, but Class notes that Mike Rogers watched a, at least a portion of the programme. Clark argues that Walton's account of his time on the UFO is quite different from the Hill account and that furthermore, there is not a great deal of similarity between Walton's and any other abduction narrative publicly discussed as of November 1975. The Aftermath in 1978 Walton published The Walton Experience, in which he outlined his own narrative of the event and its aftermath. 
the same year Bill Barry published The Ultimate Encounter, in which he argues that various debunkers, especially class, did not make persuasive cases and that Walton and other allegedly similar experiences related events more or less as they believed they had happened. Matheson argues that Walton's book makes a few fundamental errors that severely harms his case. While Walton proclaims self-righteously that he intends only to relate events and not interpret them, Matheson writes, the reader will see almost immediately that large sections of the book are nothing more than highly speculative, purely imaginative recreations on his part. For example, after he is knocked unconscious by the blue beam, Walton offers precise novelistic dialogue describing the com conversations of his fellow crew workers after they drove away in a panic. Yet Walton never mentions whether he is paraphrasing their words based on what they related to him. If he interviewed the others to determine who or what, sorry, who said what, or if he simply assumed what they had said. Matheson argues that this represents a lack of concern for literal accuracy and that the reader cannot help but suspect a characteristic of the entire work. After the initial furor subsided, Walton remained in Snowflake and eventually became the foreman at the lumber mill. He married Dana Rogers and they had several children. Beyond the film based on his encounter, Walton has occasionally appeared at UFO conventions or on television specials. Fire in the Sky in 1993. Walton's book was adapted into a film, Fire in the Sky, directed by Robert Lieberman and starring D.B. Sweeney as Travis Walton, Robert Patrick as Mike Rogers and Scott MacDonald as Walton's brother, Dan Walton. Clark writes that the film found moderate success, mixed reviews and ufologists complained about its inaccuracies and exaggerations. Especially inaccurate was the portion of the film detailing his time on the UFO. It bears almost no resemblance to the original narrative. Screenwriter Tracy Torm even sent letters to many ufologists, claiming that the changes were requested by studio officials and apologising for making such substantial alterations to Walter's narrative. Walton and Mike Rogers made a few promotional appearances to support the film. They debated Class on Larry King Live and at one point Class lost his temper and called Rogers a goddamn liar. In his book, Clark does not offer any background context to explain Class's remark on Larry King Live. In the renewed publicity generated by the motion picture, Walton... Mike Rogers and Alan Dallas agreed to take polygraph examinations on the behest of a sceptical ufologist, Jerry Black. Again, the tests were conducted by C. Gilson and the men all asserted that the events as they related them were true. Gilson concluded that all three men were truthful in regard to their responses about the events of November the 5th, 1975. At the time of the film's release, Walton reissued The Walton Experience under the same title as the film, expanding it to conclude text, rebuting Class's commentary. So, what do you think of Travis Walton? Do you believe he was actually abducted by a UFO? If you think he did... Leave a comment in the section below. I'd be interested in your thought on this story. Personally, myself, something definitely happened on that day. And I truly believe myself, he was taken onto some kind of craft. But who are they? And where did they leave after they left him behind? After all those days? Who knows? I don't think anyone's ever really going to know. But another question, 
Did they ever come back? And if they did come back, did they take him again? And he just didn't remember? Makes for a good thought, doesn't it? Thank you for listening.